Welcome to today's webinar, Hugging the Cactus, Wrapping Your Arms Around the Media, brought to you by NCSL. All lines have been placed on a listen-only mode to provide favorable sound quality during today's presentation. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Gene Rose. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Randy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar sponsored by the National Conference of State Legislatures and the Legislative Staff Coordinating Committee. This is the seventh webinar that is part of the NCSL University Series. We hope you'll join us as we explore other issues and provide professional development opportunities throughout the year. Previous sessions on social media trends, social media policy issues, child abuse reporting laws, an April report on the fiscal health of the states, and one on the 225th anniversary of the U.S. Constitution are all archived and available on the NCSL website. Those sessions are free for state legislators and legislative staff. My presentation today is on media relations, which many people enjoy as much as hugging a cactus. My presentation will last about 40 minutes, and then we'll open up the rest of the hour for your questions. You may drop a question into the chat box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen at any time during the presentation today. So let's get started. Who am I and why can I talk about media relations? I started out my career as a reporter in a small town in uh, Missouri and worked at a sports desk in Michigan uh, for a while before uh, going into uh, the public service arena. And I was the communications director for the Missouri House of Representatives where I worked for about 15 years. And then uh, for about 15 years also, I was the public affairs director for the National Conference of state legislatures. Uh, right now, I work for the strategic communications firm of Marmillion & Company, uh, where I'm the executive vice president. So, hugging the cactus, we're going to go in three different sections today. We're going to try to understand the cactus, we're going to learn about approaching the cactus, and then how to actually hug the cactus, which leads to the question, how do you hug the cactus? And, of course, the answer is very carefully. So, to understand the cactus, uh, first let's get out of the way why is it important to talk to the media. Uh, I've certainly, in my uh, career, uh, particularly uh, at NCSL and the Missouri House of Representatives, uh, I wish I had a dollar for every time that I heard a legislator or legislative staff person say that I don't want to talk to media, I don't ever want to talk to the media. And these are kind of the main reasons why they give me why they don't want to talk to the media, that it can only get them into trouble, they're always misquoted, or that the uh, newspaper or radio station or television station uh, tends to side with one political party and will never listen to the, uh, to the other side. So all of those are, are excuses that are, uh, are understandable uh, because uh, there are a bad – the people have had very bad experiences uh, with the media, uh, and, and people uh, uh, consequently – uh, view them, uh, view the media as a cactus, and they don't want to approach them uh, very aggressively. Um, but what what I have found, and uh, over my career, I realized that that having that relationship with the media is important for uh, for a number of reasons. First, uh, the media still, uh, even with the all the changes that's happening in online communications today, and we're going to talk about that uh, here in a little bit more. Uh, but news remains the number one source where people uh, get their information about what is going on uh, in state government. Uh, so even though that we have a proliferation of bloggers and other sources of, uh, of information where, where people uh, uh, are gravitating to, the media is still where people get their most information about, about state government. The second most important point is that there's no chance of your side being part of the story if you don't talk to the press. Um, and this is a, a very, it's very important to remember because uh, the press will only report on what people tell them. Uh, the, the press is not necessarily uh, charged with the responsibility of uh, uh, checking statements uh, and then uh, you know, fact-checking them before they're, they're published the next day. Uh, what they will do is they will report on what people tell them and then uh, let the national dialogue or state dialogue or local dialogue play out uh, and, uh, and, and let people kind of determine their, their own truth there. So if you don't talk to the press, your side is not going to be represented in, uh, in that uh, discussion. And also it's very important to remember that this really is part of the uh, democratic process. Um, and I'm always reminded of the quote from Thomas Jefferson who said, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. And I think that's very, uh, very important to remember um, as we're uh, thinking about um, 
meet the media and, and our relationship with them. Our country is uh, definitely better served, I believe, uh, with a, a free press. And you can just ask the countries that don't have one uh, what, the, what their opinion is on, on that as well. Uh, one thing that we are going to do today is uh, to, to keep this as interactive as possible. I've got uh, 10 questions that I am going to uh, ask you today. So we are going to start with uh, question number one here on what is the best definition of news? So you're going to see pop up on your screen now. Um, what is news best defined by? One, information that's most important to the reader or viewer. Number two, what affects the most people? Number three, something new, unusual, different, or controversial. Or number four, what can sell the most papers or get the biggest rating? Okay, let's see what... Um, so on the polling question, uh, the best answer for what news is best defined by is to see something new, unusual, different, or uh, controversial. controversial. Um, we had worked with, uh, over the years, an uh, uh, internationally known uh, company, PR company called Fleshman Hillard, and they describe news as everything, it, uh, any story that appears in a newspaper, on radio, or television, tends to fall into these categories. Uh, where the uh, story is about winners or losers, heroes and villains, criticism, controversy, or conflict, uh, something new, unusual, or different, or a trend or a change. So, um, and to make this presentation as fresh as possible, I just went out today, um, and I encourage anybody that has not done this before, uh, the museum in uh, Washington, D.C., every day print, uh, print pages of the nation's uh, newspapers. Uh, so I just kind of selected three at random today, uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the uh, Louisville, Louisville Courier Journal, and the Seattle Times, uh, to see what kind of stories they're talking about today. Uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, obviously a big sports town, so Roger Clemens kind of uh, uh, leads, uh, leads the story there. Uh, of course, the trial of uh, Jerry Sandusky uh, from Penn State, uh, obviously something uh, hugely uh, locally important there. Uh, the Courier Journal has a story about state pensions, uh, but uh, uh, chose to feature something on, on Facebook today. So again, they're, they're looking at something that's new and different, some kind of trend that's going on. Uh, and then in the Seattle Times, uh, the big story is about Microsoft, which is obviously a, a, a company very important to their uh, local area, uh, launching a, a, a new tablet. Uh, so if you look at the headlines of all those stories, you'll see that they'll fall into those categories. They're, they're talking about either winners or losers, heroes or villains, criticism, controversy, conflict, or something that's new, unusual, different, or a trend or a change. So let's talk about the uh, the environment that journalists are are working in uh, today. Uh, the um, U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics uh, released uh, information recently that, said that estimated there are about 58,000 reporters in the United States. And when they look at the job outlook for reporters uh, over the next 10 years, well, between uh, 2010 and 2020, that uh, it's estimated to uh, be reduced by about 6%. Uh, over that 10-year uh, period. Now, between 2007 and 2011, uh, we see that there was an 11% loss in uh, newspaper jobs across the country, which is definitely uh, something that is affecting that, uh, that industry. Interestingly, they say that the only area where they're expecting a growth uh, is broadcast journalists. Uh, and we're going to be talking uh, quite a bit about uh, television, as you can uh, see as we go through uh, the presentation today. But that uh, that really seems to be the only area where they're expecting uh, any type of growth in that, in that industry. One of the greatest, uh, most interesting things that's uh, happening uh, in newspapers today, uh, many of you are probably very familiar that the Times Picune down in New Orleans uh, recently announced that they're only going to be going to a three days a week uh, publication, uh, which is which is very interesting. When I started uh, my career uh, in, the night, uh, in the early 80s, I worked in a newspaper in Fulton, Missouri, which at the time could claim that it was the smallest town in America that had daily competing newspapers, and you know, the uh, size of the town was only about uh, 12,000 people. And so what we're having now is that you've got uh, one of the top uh, 60 markets uh, in America in terms of uh, circulation size. Uh, a newspaper deciding that they are only going to actually print something three days a week, and again with speculation uh, being that that uh, uh, that eventually the paper may go away and just be uh, simply an online online product, and we're probably going to be seeing that type of um, 
trend uh, continue in the major metropolitan cities uh, across America. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and interesting enough, uh, the American Journalism Review a few years ago did a survey and found that there were only really 513 reporters that are uh, covering state capitals uh, in America today, which means that for every 14 uh, legislators, there were only uh, one reporter, and the, and the ratio between media to legislative staff was 158. But yet, when it came to covering the Super Bowl, uh, they issued 3,000 uh, credentials uh, there, meaning that there were more than 35 uh, media people there for every uh, player uh, on the sideline. Uh, next slide, please. So what uh, what motivates journalists? The Society of Professional Journalists has this on uh, on their site. Uh, and if you read those second and third paragraphs uh, there, to ensure that the, the, what, what they expect out of journalists is to ensure that the concept of self-government outlined by the U.S. Constitution remains a reality into future centuries. The American people must be well informed in order to make decisions regarding their lives in their local and national communities. It is the role of journalists to provide this information in an accurate, comprehensive, timely, and understandable manner. So that's what they, um, the, the society that kind of governs uh, a journalist and, and uh, looks over a journalist's uh, ethical behavior, um, points out that, that really journalists enter this uh, this field and, and want to be journalists because they really they are viewing themselves as public servants. They are serving a greater public good. Um, and so the the media often gets criticized because uh, they expose wrong. That people often say that the uh, media does not do enough to talk about good news and good things that are happening. Where I think a journalist kind of uh, their viewpoint is that you know good news is what people should be doing all the time, and so we need to be exposing things that uh, that are not good. So that this is kind of the mindset where where journalists come from. If we go to the next slide, please. One thing journalists uh, who uh, attend my uh, presentations uh, like uh, they like this part of it because they want people to know that the journalist, it's the editors that write the headline, not the journalist, because you have headlines like this. Volunteers are needed to help torture survivors. Next, please. The governor signs open records law with teeth. It's a very talented governor, don't you think? Next. Legislators say fix school funding during breakfast. We don't want to do it during lunch or dinner. But we only want to do it during breakfast. Next. Base closings get Bush's okay. Congress next. I guess the president is thinking about closing Congress next. Next. Judges appear more lenient when they're on the crack cocaine. And finally, police are told by mayors to stop looting. So those are just kind of the funny headlines that have been uh, collected over the years that uh, uh, kind of bring to light uh, uh, some things that, you know, in a newsroom, the way the newsroom operates is that a reporter will turn in the story, gets edited, and someone else will decide the headline. And then, so there's a process that, process that goes along there. And it's very important to remember this when you're uh, when you're dealing with with the press. So let's go to the next slide, please. And Randy, I will get your help on this uh, poll question. If we could go to uh, the second question on our list. Most articles and broadcast stories about government are generated on, and that will be number two. Take a few seconds to decide whether you think articles are generated by news releases or press conferences, reporters' personal interactions and reflections, editors' assignments, or news tips. And then, Randy, if you could post the results for us. So most police, most people uh, in the audience today, 53% believe that it's the result of news releases or press conferences with reporters' personal interactions and reflections uh, coming in second place. So let's return to the slide and advance to the next one. And the, the, uh, the correct answer is reporters' personal interactions and, and reflections. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next uh, slide, Randy, and we'll explain uh, here why why that's true. A few years ago at NCSL, we did a survey where we surveyed uh, about 100 reporters and about 100 legislators uh, across the country and asked them various questions about uh, how they interact with each other. And then one of the questions we asked is where we asked them to rank where you believe uh, that reporters get their story ideas. 
and you'll see on the left, reporters said that conversation introspection was their number one way of getting uh, getting stories ideas, story ideas, whereas legislators uh, thought it might be news tips from inside the legislatures and then press releases and press conferences being uh, the second highest. But if you look on the reporters' side on the left, you'll see that uh, press releases and press conferences are very low, actually number four uh, on the list. Now, this is not to suggest that we should uh, stop doing uh, press releases, should stop holding press conferences, but that if you really want to get a reporter's attention, it's having those personal interactions with them, uh, being able to talk to them about uh, uh, potential story ideas and, and letting them know uh, your knowledge about a particular subject area. That is going to carry a lot more weight uh, than a press release or, or press conference uh, in terms of a reporter's eyes. So uh, now that we've uh, talked about understanding the uh, cactus. Let's go to the next slide, please. We're going to learn about how to approach the cactus. And let's go to our next slide and let's take another poll question. For the greatest exposure, would you would rather have your story appear? And Randy, if you'll poll up there, the answers are A in the newspaper, B in a magazine, C on radio, or four on television. So most people seem to think number four on television, and that's coming in second place uh, uh, in the newspaper. Okay, let's go back to our our slides and go to the next one, please. And on television is the right answer, uh, just in terms of, of greater exposure. Now, um, before we go to the next slide, let me just say that a lot of this does depend on what you are trying to accomplish. Uh, obviously, most of you that are uh, online today work in the legislative arena, where newspapers still seem uh, still hold a very important place uh, in influencing uh, policy makers. It's the, those things are still passed around. Uh, those uh, links uh, get uh, distributed to uh, to members and staff. Uh, so the, the newspaper does become very, very important there. But if you're talking about the number of people that actually see the uh, story and the general public, uh, television uh, tends to be the right answer. If we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, the Pew, um, uh, Pew Research Center for the People in the Press uh, do a survey every couple of years, and it's been very interesting to uh, follow during my time uh, in this uh, industry. And you can see that uh, you know up until uh, uh, 2004, when uh, uh, the online element uh, entered the picture here, that still uh, the people that uh, get their news from TV is still very much highly raised. Uh, newspapers and, and radio. And then over the last few years, uh, online has uh, caught up uh, to newspapers and, and radio and, and become a, a very important force. Uh, and that study should be uh, being updated this year, and it's uh, very likely that uh, online uh, could surpass those, uh, those other two uh, topic areas. But you still see that uh, news on TV is, is still where uh, people uh, still tend to, get their, uh, tend to get their information. If we go to the next slide, please. In the changing news uh, landscape, now the, the question is a little bit tricky that I ask because it, uh, I ask pretty much about the most uh, most eyeballs or the, the most people that, that that you tend to influence. But if you're looking at this just from a public relations standpoint, or how am I going to reach the people that I need to reach? Uh, if you look at these statistics, you'll see the the age categories uh, there under TV news. Uh, definitely, uh, people at 35 and older. Uh, Get, uh, tend to get their information there. So uh, if, if that's the target audience you kind of want to reach with your message, then, then you would focus on that. Uh, same with the uh, newspapers, uh, but that tends to uh, track a little bit older, uh, 50 uh, and higher. Uh, the radio uh, tends to attract more uh, people between 35 and 49. And again, on the online news, you can see that the people 25 to 34 and 35 to 49 uh, hold the largest uh, percentages there. So if you're looking for an, a younger audience uh, to get your message out, uh, then that's the way you want to go. Uh, back in the day when I first started, uh, I knew if I put out a press release uh, about 3 o'clock uh, in the afternoon that I could pretty much count on being on the 6 o'clock news that night uh, in the newspaper the next morning. and. Uh, and uh, the, the radio uh, broadcast during uh, drive time the, the next day. Um, this has all changed. The, the American people have become much more segmented in where they want to get their news. So it, it's no longer uh, a situation where you can just put out a press release and expect everybody to uh, to get the information that they uh, that they need. Uh, you really have to be more targeted in knowing who you want to uh, who you want to go after. 
So let's advance to the next slide, please. We have another uh, polling question uh, for you. Um, the average soundbite for presidential candidates used by the news networks in the 2008 election is, and your choices are 1, 12.2 seconds, B, 9.5 seconds, 3, 7.3 seconds, or 4, 4.9 seconds. Please submit your answer now. Okay, and most people seem to think it was number four, 4.9 seconds, with 7.3 coming in second place there. And let's go back to the slide in advance. And the correct answer is 7.9 uh, seconds. Uh, it probably seems more like uh, 4.9 now, as we are definitely getting into the presidential uh, season again this year. If we can advance to the next slide, Randy. But what you can see that has happened uh, over the years, that uh, back in 1968, uh, the average sound bite was 43 seconds, uh, if you can uh, imagine that. Uh, in 1988, it dropped down to 9.8 seconds, and then uh, 2008. Uh, down to 7.9 seconds. Uh, and will it be lower in uh, the 2012 election? That uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, but obviously, this is uh, a, a, something to really keep in mind when you are a legislator or a staff person, or, or perhaps a staff person uh, uh, writing talking points or a, a speech or uh, remarks for a state legislator, uh, that this is kind of your, your target range. And if we can go to the next slide, please, Randy. Uh, what this means is you've got about 30 words. That's 30 words if you're uh, talking uh, fairly, fairly quickly. Uh, but you can squeeze about 30 words into a 7.9-second uh, sound bite. So uh, when you are crafting those messages, when you're trying to put those type of things together, trying to come up with something that's going to resonate with the public, uh, this is kind of your guide mark on uh, what you have to work with. And uh, let's advance to the next slide, please, Randy. Um, uh, again, these type of uh, quotes, these type of messages are, are fairly easy to find. And again, I uh, just went out this morning and uh, kind of grabbed three that uh, caught my eye without uh, really uh, looking uh, too terribly hard for them. Uh, this first one comes from USA Today, and it's a story about uh, uh, college uh, uh, graduates and their job prospects. Uh, and uh, this person, Tim Emmer, said, we prepared the path for the child instead of the child for the path, which is a pretty good quote in itself. Uh, but then he added to it, we've paved the way, but now there are unpaved roads out there that are rocky and dirty. So what makes this a, a good sound bite is that uh, uh, it creates an image. It, it paints a picture for the audience uh, for them to uh, kind of understand what, what we're talking about. There. Everybody understands what, uh, what a rocky and, and dirty unpaved road is. So, uh, so putting those two together, he definitely comes under 7.9 uh, seconds. Uh, on that uh, sound bite, and again, came up with a pretty good visual uh, image for uh, to share with people to get his message across. Let's go to the next one, uh, and I think this is a, a, a pretty clever quote on, on a number of, uh, of levels here. Uh, I just don't like the concept of drones flying over barbecues in New York to see whether you have a big gulp in your backyard or whether you're, you're separating your recyclables according to the city mandate. Uh, this is Senator Rand Paul. Uh, 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 in an interview that was uh, uh, in the Associated Press uh, this morning. And, and what he's done here is he's actually taken a, a couple of issues, the uh, the uh, concern that some Americans have right now about drones uh, flying over uh, in America and uh, invading their privacy, uh, and then the whole issue about uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg's uh, uh, proposal in New York to uh, limit the size of soft drinks that, uh, uh, that can be sold. So uh, what uh, what uh, Senator Rand, uh, Senator Paul has done here uh, is uh, create an image that you know everybody can uh, see a drone flying over a barbecue and you know, zooming into a picture of a big gulp, and so it, it's uh, it, it's it's clever in its own way. Uh, whether no matter where you come on uh, down on this issue, you have to respect someone that comes up with a way that kind of makes it easy for uh, for people to understand what uh, uh, the message that he's trying to deliver here. Let's go to the next one. This one comes from the Chicago Tribune. And when you are creating your metaphors, when you're creating your messages, you have to be very careful uh, not to mix your metaphors. Uh, this uh, young uh, person who uh, uh, is a uh, storm chaser uh, from Oklahoma said that uh, the, the story is about people that uh, – uh, who are are essentially tourists that are looking to track storms and not professional storm trackers. Uh, and so uh, his quote is, this happens every year with storm chasing. Every once in a while we have a bad apple that gets us all a black eye. So I think he's kind of mixing metaphors there, but again, he's got imagery uh, there with it. And uh, and to uh, to his credit, the uh, Chicago uh, Tribune uh, published the quote. So, uh, but something to be careful as, as we're uh, uh, 
defining and developing our messages. So let's go to the next slide. I want to share uh, three that uh, um, we had people at uh, NCSL uh, said that have always stuck with me. I thought were very, uh, very good quotes to use as, as examples. And uh, actually, uh, two of these would fall under the 4.9 um, uh, second option that we had uh, in our poll a little bit earlier. Uh, but uh, uh, someone was talking about the difficulty of a uh, certain type of legislation. Le excuse me, legislation, and so it's like trying to spell a word while stirring alphabet soup. Again, it's, it's an image that, you know, people can picture, them, picture themselves with a bowl of alph alphabet soup trying to uh, create a word and knowing how, how difficult it is. Um, when electric uh, deregulation um, uh, uh, was first, first came to light and, and then some uh, issues started coming up with it, the, our analysts there said, we now know that the rose has thorns, uh, which is a, a very, was a very appropriate metaphor for, uh, for what was happening. Uh, and then when states were having their uh, uh, fiscal crises, uh, we had one of our analysts that said the fiscal situation facing states is like a bad horror movie. The details get more gruesome and the story never seems to end. Uh, so again, something that is uh, very relatable uh, to people. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, even though the, the average sound bite is going down for network newscasts, th there's another trend in industry, and again, we kind of keep coming back to television in our, uh, in our talks today, but there are a lot more 30-minute news shows on, on the air uh, today than there ever have been uh, before where politicians and public servants and uh, advocates uh, have a forum to go to uh, to try to uh, sell their message. Uh, used to be you just had the uh, ABC, CBS, and uh, NBC uh, Sunday morning uh, talk shows uh, were kind of the only forum that the national people had. But um, uh, it, again, with audiences becoming more segmented and people being a little bit more choosy about the, where they get their news and their information, uh, you see that it's uh, uh, those type of opportunities are becoming are becoming better. So when you appear on these type of programs, you don't want to talk in 7.9 uh, second sound bites. You want to be able to uh, uh, to back up your facts, and we're going to talk up about how to develop those key messages here in just a moment. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. The other thing that is uh, really happening uh, here is the YouTube revolution. Um, many people don't realize that uh, YouTube is actually the number two search engine uh, in, in America. So when people are looking up information, they're not always just going to Google and uh, typing in the search term. A lot of people are going to YouTube to see what kind of video is available for, um, uh, for a certain subject area. And in the time that uh, this slide is appearing on screen right now, 48 hours of content is being uploaded on YouTube uh, as we speak. Uh, so there's just more and more of that type of content being out there. Uh, and again, it's kind of one of those things that uh, we, we can get into social media at another time, but that if you don't have some sort of video presence, then, uh, then your, uh, your message is going to get uh, lost. So let's go to the next slide and start talking about the key messages and how, how we develop those. So if you're working on this particular project or you're uh, working with a legislator or are a legislator, uh, you have to uh, kind of figure out what your key message points are. Uh, if, if you could have a, a headline written in the newspaper uh, uh, tomorrow morning, what, what would those things be? So when we talk about key messages, we want one or two sentences that kind of describe something and kind of uh, in that sound bite time limit. It has to be clear and concise. It needs to be quotable. It needs to be compelling and passionate. And let's go to the next slide. And this is a kind of an example from uh, NCSL uh, here where you, you have three levels, essentially, of, of message. Your, your key message is the one that kind of overarches, and if you wanted to think about it, it's uh, the top of the pyramid. And then level two uh, tends to be a little bit more substantive, uh, what your supporting points are. And then level three, you get into statistics. So at NCSL, their uh, tagline is the state legislatures are the forum for America's ideas. And so you get to level two, what are the three supporting points for that? Well, number one is, well, Congress remains gridlocked, states are leading the way on issues, and then you pick the, what those people, uh, what those uh, current issues of the day are. Uh, and the second uh, uh, supporting point would be that Congress has followed the state leads uh, on issues that, like, such as welfare reform, uh, health care, and education. Uh, and then number three, state legislature produced balanced budgets, which obviously uh, Congress uh, does not. So, uh, And then under each of those three um, 
supporting points there, you'd have statistics in order to back up. Now, sometimes reporters call you, and all they all they're really looking for is that number one, that key message. What is the what is the tagline? What is that you're trying to sell? What is that sound bite? Uh, some need a little bit more information, so they're going to uh, do a follow-up question where you have those supporting points uh, available to you. And then, if they really want to get into the weeds on things, then you've got your statistics uh, to back things up. So let's go to the next slide and. And, and why, why is this important to have this uh, message? Uh, there's a, uh, uh, an old cliche out there uh, that when uh, someone doesn't like uh, something that's being changed, they say it's like putting lipstick on a pig. But if that, so say that is your message point. Um, that you can do lots of things with this. You think about, okay, how can I take that message and how can I sell it to the media? Can I put on some sort of event where I bring uh, pigs in dressed in costumes? Uh, can I deliver a speech? Uh, that will uh, demonstrate just how, uh, how poor uh, this idea is to put this lipstick on the pig. What can I do with social media uh, using this theme to uh, get, get my message out? What kind of publications or brochures uh, can I do to uh, uh, put together that would uh, help me deliver my message? Uh, and then uh, finally, you want to make sure that you have some kind of response to the pig lobby because the pig lobby is obviously going to re uh, respond to your, uh, to your statement. So let's go to the next slide, and we're going to talk about so we, we developed our key messages, and, and, and one of the issues that people have is how, how do we get that message out to when a reporter asks us a question. Uh, so we're talking about blocking and bridging. You don't want to ignore or evade a question. You want to address its topic, talk about the problem and not the solution. And we don't want to say uh, no, no comment. Um, go to the next slide, please. I promised uh, seven uh, phrases that you can use. Uh, I've, I've got a couple more here. Uh, how you get from one talking point to another. Now, if you watch any of those shows uh, that uh, I had on the, uh, the previous slide about all the, the Sunday morning talk shows and uh, the various shows on Fox and MSNBC uh, and, and other uh, stations, you're going to hear these uh, phrases quite a bit. So if a reporter asks you about something, you really want to talk to something else, or they phrase the question in such a way that doesn't really match or help you get to the, your message point, you want to say things like, I think what you're really trying to get at here is, or that speaks to a bigger point, the real issue here, what, what you're asking is. The other thing that, that, that people really want to uh, pay attention to is that when, when a question gets asked of you in a way that has a negative connotation, you don't want to repeat that negative connotation. You want to do uh, uh, one of the two statements there at the end. You want to say that just the opposite is true or simply that's false. You don't want to repeat that, uh, that statement and then go to your next, um, uh, next point. So if we'll go to our next slide, the, the other technique that we want to keep in mind is headlining. And uh, when you are dealing with a reporter, particularly ones that want, you know, that, that talk to you for about 20 or 30 minutes and really trying to understand the issue and stuff, at, at the end of the conversation, it's a really important time to say, well, you know, we've talked about a lot of things today, but I think that these are the most important things to remember. Um, and the last statement there, let me make one thing perfectly clear. If you are in a press conference or something and, and you make that statement, that's a signal to the reporters that what you're about to say is, is very important and it's going to be a good summary or potential soundbite. Uh, for the, uh, for your uh, for your message, so keep these uh, statements in in your back pocket uh, that you can pull out to make sure that you can kind of headline uh, or uh, kind of give a a signal that that, that you're about to uh, deliver uh, a soundbite. So let's go to the next slide. We've uh, talked about uh, studying and approaching the cactus, and so now we're going to uh, take that uh, step up there and actually give that cactus a hug. So let's go to the next uh, slide, and it's another polling question. Uh, when being interviewed, you have the right to, and uh, Randy will get our, our questions up there, and the choices are set certain ground rules. Two, do uh, nothing. The reporter sets the ground rules. Number three, has to review the article or story before the print or broadcast. Or number four, change or revise the quote. Please submit your answer now. Number one, well, we've got a very smart uh, audience here. Seventy-five percent say set certain red ground rules. Uh, so, Randy, if we can go to the uh, uh, next slide, please. And you are absolutely right that you do have the right to set uh, certain ground rules. And what are those ground rules? So on our next slide, um, you have the right to know the topic, to know the format, you actually have the right to buy time. There are lots of times, uh, particularly in the legislative arena, where a legislator 
uh, staff person or whatever is, is walking off the floor and uh, is surrounded by press, uh, you don't have to take those questions right there. You can uh, tell people, let's meet back in my office in 10 minutes or I'll come back on the hallway in 10 minutes or something like that. Uh, if you feel you need some time to prepare, uh, you have the right to, uh, right to do that. Uh, misstatements, if they're made in the question, you need to uh, correct those uh, so that uh, false information does not get, uh, get out there. You have time to answer the question, use notes, and uh, even to record the interview. In some states, you don't have to let the reporter know, but it's usually a, a good thing. I used to do that uh, early in my career. I'd record interviews just so I could play them back and, and uh, see how I did. Now, while you have these rights, uh, there are certain rights that you do not have. Let's go to the next slide, please. You do not have the right to know the questions in advance or to see the story in advance to change your quotes, to edit the story, or expect your view to be the only view uh, published, or to demand that an article be published. So you need to know those things going, going in. Um, most reporters, I mean, it is very rarely that a reporter would ever let you know what kind of questions they're going to ask you uh, in advance, but they, they definitely need to ask you the topic. Typically, it's going to be there. If they're talking to you, then there's a reasonable assumption there that they feel that you know something about this topic, so you're not going to get uh, asked something. Now, there might be a, a fact or some uh, data that you may not have, and there's nothing wrong with telling a reporter that you can get back to, with them uh, on that. But uh, it's very important to understand these rights. So let's go to our next slide, which is another uh, question, and uh, we've kind of touched on this briefly, but uh, no comment is, and your choices uh, in the poll are going to be number one, the best way to avoid answering a sensitive question, the signal reporters that you're covering up something, uh, three, sometimes appropriate, and number four, never appropriate, please submit your question in. Okay, most people said uh, uh, D, never appropriate, 36%, uh, 33% said sometimes appropriate, and 27% said uh, number two is signal reporters that you're covering up something. So uh, again, we're kind of divided audience on this, and let's uh, go back to our slide and, and see what my interpretation is. And B, it's the signal reporters that you're covering up something. Now, the, the, the interesting part of this question is that what is the truth and what uh, what is perception? Uh, and uh, as we always uh, say in this business, that uh, uh, perception is reality. So even though no comment may really mean that uh, you're uh, uh, that, that you really don't have a comment, that there's really nothing that that, that you can say. In the reporter's mind and in the public's mind, it re it, it's a signal that you're covering up something. So that is that is what the perception of it is. So that's why we advise that uh, that you do not say um, uh, no comment. Uh, that you know it's best to say I'll get back to you on that, or I don't have anything to say on that issue at this point. Uh, but just those terms, no comment, uh, tend to be a, a signal that uh, that you're covering up something. Again, just from a perception uh, standpoint. So let's go to the next uh, slide, which is uh, another polling question. Um, I'm sorry. No, it's not. <laughs> well, uh, uh, interview tips. Uh, let's talk about the uh, what you uh, should do. The best way to prepare for for an interview. Again, you should always buy yourself uh, some time if possible. If if you feel that uh, that you need it, if you need to brush up on something before talking to the reporter. Uh, if it's a phone interview um, or uh, something in your office, you want an interview setting so that you're not uh, uh, distracted by anything. That your email is turned off. Your your phone is turned off so that you can uh, totally focus on what. Uh, uh, what's being asked of you, uh, let your message points guide your uh, responses, and uh, talk slowly for more accurate quotes. Uh, I cannot tell you the number of times that I've uh, uh, heard a reporter's keys clicking in the background while I said something, uh, and he's asked me to go back and say, what did you say just uh, just briefly to that? And then uh, I, you know, it's hard to recreate exactly what you said, even though I knew that it was a really good uh, sound bite uh, at that point. Uh, but the main thing is, the next slide, is to always remember uh, that uh, that when anytime you're talking to a reporter, you're really having a presentation. It's not a conversation that you're having with that uh, reporter. So let's go to the next slide, which now is uh, another polling question: Is what does off the record mean? Uh, so we've talked about uh, no comment. Uh, so let's go to see what the um, uh, uh, possible choices are here. Does off the record mean what you say will not be used, or what you say may be used but without your name? Or what you say is for background will not be used within the story, or is it different things to different people? Okay, and again, the audience is uh, uh, ahead of me here. 72% believe it's different things to different people. Uh, and we can go back to the slides, Randy, and you are uh, absolutely right. Um, 
this is one of the most uh, dangerous areas for uh, for people to uh, to get into. And if we actually go to the next slide, Randy, um, these definitions uh, come from uh, uh, journalism associations about what off the record means, not per attribution, background, deep back background. Uh, so th these are what they're supposed to mean. But if we'll advance to the next slide, Randy. Our advice is that it's just not worth going here unless you have a complete understanding with the reporter what it exactly means. Um, and the other thing that we uh, caution people about is that uh, I've been to a number of press conferences where a, uh, a public official has said, uh, it makes a statement and goes, oh, by the way, that's off the record. Uh, that does not work. Uh, once it is out of your mouth, it is there for uh, public consumption. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, Robert McCloskey, who was uh, with the Defense Department, uh, made this statement from the podium one day when a reporter was uh, uh, trying to uh, pinpoint him on something. He says, I know that what you believe, you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. <laughs> so uh, sometimes it's very difficult to get uh, get your point across. Uh, let's go to the next slide, which is uh, we're ending our uh, uh, coming close to the end of our polling questions here. When a reporter makes a factual mistake in the story, what should you do? Um, we'll get this question up here. Uh, the choices are do nothing. No one would see the correction anyway. Have your public information office write a press release so news outlets don't use the same facts in future stories. Let the reporter immediately know about the mistake or call the editor publisher. Let them know about the reporter's shoddy reporting. Make your selection now, please, and then publish when ready, Randy. And uh, I'll take this time, too, that if you have some questions and want to go ahead and put them in the chat box, we'll, I'll get to those uh, here very shortly. Okay, so 94% of the people say let the reporter immediately know about the mistake, and uh, you all are absolutely right again. Um, and we can go into the uh, advance of the two slides, uh, Randy. Um, the the reporter uh, reporters really truly appreciate this. I used to be very hesitant to you know uh, try to call out a reporter on something because I, I was afraid that they would you know offend them some way. But 100% uh, of the times that I've called a reporter uh, to tell them that there was a factual mistake. Uh, they've been very receptive to it. The, the problem becomes if it's a uh, a state uh, if, if the um, thing that you're trying to correct is, is more uh, nuanced or uh, something that's uh, that's more interpretation than it is rather than uh, rather than fact. Uh, so let's go to our next one, uh, Randy, which is another uh, poll question. At noon, a newspaper reporter says she needs information for a story she needs to file at uh, 5 p.m. The information is sensitive. You should provide the information when. As soon as you have it, two hours before the deadline, an hour before the deadline, or 15 minutes before the deadline. Make your selection now, please. Okay, 87% of the people say as soon as you have it. And again, you're right. It's a very smart crowd we have here today. And the reason for this, uh, obviously, you can go to the uh, uh, next slide. Randy, the, uh, the obvious reason for this is if the reporter has questions or some follow-up, if you wait until 15 minutes before the deadline, there's not going to be a lot of time to uh, to get things corrected or uh, to uh, make sure that the reporter understood uh, correctly the information that, uh, that you've delivered to them. Plus, uh, it just makes everything look more transparent uh, to the reporter. Uh, so let's uh, go to the next slide. And uh, again, when, you, when you're when you get a request for an interview, you always need to know who the reporter is, what their affiliation is, and it's very fair to ask what story are you working on and what is their deadline so you can get your schedules uh, together, and then you promise to get back or before a deadline. But the other thing that's very important is to know whether something is going to be uh, live, if it, it's going to be something that's going to be edited, uh, and, and where, where it's going to be held. And if you are doing a TV interview and you have a chance to hold it somewhere, then uh, try to pick something with a background that is uh, uh, visually very interesting. The, uh, um, the uh, news crews will appreciate that a lot. So let's go to our final polling question on our next slide, which is you are given an option as to when a television or radio reporter comes to visit to do a story for that night's news. Should you schedule the interview for 1, 10 a.m., B, 2 p.m., C, 3.30 p.m., or D, live at 5? Make your selection now. Okay. So uh, most people, 59% uh, said uh, 10 a.m. with the live at 5 being second at uh, 20% and 15% uh, said at 2 o'clock. So let's advance to the next slide, Randy. And my advice, and again, this is not uh, um, always, the, uh, uh, always the best situation, but I would suggest live at 5. And there are a couple of reasons for that. 
number one, if it is a live interview, there's no chance of uh, your uh, your interview being edited. Uh, you have to be able to uh, the person doing the interview has to have some comfort level that they can uh, help control the interview or be ready for any um, any dangerous questions and things like that. But you have much more control over that. Uh, if you do it earlier in the day, uh, then obviously they're going to get some other people to uh, uh, to talk to, and then your uh, your part just becomes a segment of that uh, of that new segment. So so live at five is a better option if that if that is one that uh, that is available to you. So uh, we've talked about a lot of things today. Uh, I kind of rushed to this, and I apologize for the, the hiccup that we had uh, earlier on the polling question. Um, but uh, any time that you do something uh, something good uh, with the media, let's go to the next slide, Randy. Uh, the NCSL annual meeting was down in San Antonio uh, last year, and one of the best pieces of advice I got was to uh, go out uh, on the river walk and, and try a, a prickly pear margarita. So uh, when you're dealing with a cactus, you might as well reward yourself with something uh, that uh, is related to the cactus uh, as well. So if you have a good media interview, uh, something goes very well, you should reward yourself there. And that's a recipe from the, uh, from the Food Network. Uh, and you can make it alcoholic or non-alcoholic, as, uh, as your choice may, may be. So let's go to the next slide. Randy, we do have a few questions in the queue. If you have some uh, questions for me, uh, please uh, get the uh, get those uh, into me now, and uh, I'll just kind of start from the first one that came in, and it was how important is it that an enti entity have a public information officer or at least one main person to establish and maintain a working relationship with the media? Should enti entities have a face that people associate with that entity? Well, the, my uh, as a uh, public relations uh, counselor and professional, I'd say that absolutely, uh, that public information officers are an essential part uh, of an organization. I, I believe that the legislatures that have that kind of uh, capability and uh, uh, capacity are, are better served. And, and they're better served, I, I know in my experience with uh, in, in Missouri that uh, I, I got a chance to work for a couple of different speakers uh, there, and uh, one uh, what did not really make the public information office a really part of the uh, uh, team that uh, was able to give input on uh, strategies and uh, uh, you know public perception and things like that. Uh, too often, I think that the public information office is given an assignment, say that you know, we're going to do this bill and we need you to put out a press release and a press conference. It's very important to kind of get that advice. Uh, it, it, it's I think it's, it's critical for legislatures to get that advice from a public information officer who can provide uh, some uh, some sense of what of how the public is going to re react uh, to something. So um, it, it's difficult in legislatures because I mean it, it's hard for them to speak with one voice because they have so many um, uh, so many voices with, within the legislature. And in some cases, the, you know, the legislative budget uh, obviously it's it's a problem and uh, it's difficult to. Um, to justify that, that kind of expense uh, sometimes. Uh, but I think that the legislatures are, are better served if they have a public information officer and, uh, uh, and, and allow that person to be, uh, be part of the, uh, uh, the strategic uh, team. Uh, again, that is my, my opinion and not uh, necessarily uh, NCSLs. Um, got a couple questions here. How can I get copies of the slides? Uh, this uh, presentation will be uh, made available to you. There will be an email that goes out uh, uh, within the next couple of days, and uh, you will be uh, able to get the uh, audio and the uh, slide portion of, uh, of this presentation. Uh, the next question is what suggestions do you have for what legislative staff ought to say to the press versus what should be provided by uh, the legislator? Um, this, it's a very interesting uh, question because the uh, there are a lot of places where uh, legislatures uh, don't want uh, staff speaking for uh, for them, and again, it's it's a, it's a very understandable thing. They prefer to get uh, get the advice and have the legislator uh, out front. Uh, to have the uh, kind of relates to the previous question about whether you have a spokesperson who is speaking for the legislature all the time. I think for the from the media's perspective, they would rather hear from uh, from the leader. They would rather hear from the the person in uh, in charge. Uh, I think to them that, that that's probably a more more powerful statement. So I, I think the the best thing that we could do is is make sure that the uh, our legislators and the leaders are advised with uh, the best uh, talking points, the best uh, strategies that uh, uh, that they can have when they're when they're talking uh, to the press. Um, 
there are a lot of legislators, legislatures that have ground rules about uh, who can talk to the press uh, in terms of staff. Uh, and again, I don't think anyone really should be talking to the press unless they've had some training and an understanding of, uh, of just how, how prickly that uh, cactus can be. Uh, another question, what is the source of your statements on uh, our rights? Uh, that uh, essentially is uh, experience. Uh, my own experience and uh, working with the uh, people at uh, Fleshman Hillard uh, before, and uh, those are uh, kind of some concepts that we've come up with over the years. And again, you know, working with journalist associations, and I think those are all acceptable things. Again, I've had uh, several uh, presentations where journalists have been present, and uh, they, they've uh, supported these uh, these kind of statements and, and agree that those uh, those things are uh, are the right right. Um, next question is if a reporter has an ask a negative question after you've just provided positive highlights, how do you steer it back in your favor? I think that, that kind of goes back uh, to that uh, question, the, uh, the blocking and bridging statements that I uh, gave you earlier, that, that you have to take something, uh, if it's asked in a negative way, and, and you say, well, I think what you're really asking me here is why is this program so successful, <laughs> or, or turn it in again to that positive positive without repeating that negative statement that, uh, that, the, that the person has put out there. Uh, but again, the, I think there's uh, oftentimes when you're at the press conference, when you're the, the person responding to those questions, and you get hit with that negativity, uh, that you know, there's, there's that human emotion that wants to react negatively, that wants to, uh, you know, that, that might upset you a little bit. And you have to, again, this is why understanding the cactus is so important, is because you have to know that, that you have to understand where, where the reporter's coming from. They're not necessarily trying to put you in a bad light. They're trying to, they're trying to make sure that, they, uh, that all the bases have been covered. And they're being watched by their other peers, too, and they don't want to be asking softball questions or questions that uh, others may not think are, are very, um, uh, are not phrased very well. So um, as, as long as you can kind of keep a level head and make sure that, that you don't let that negative question bother you, Looking at those blocking and bridging points to turn it back into a positive statement, I think that will uh, serve you very well. Uh, next question, is there a way to improve a relationship with editorial boards? Uh, an excellent question, and that's uh, something we didn't get into a lot today, uh, that newspapers have different, uh, different departments. Uh, the editorial division does not necessarily talk to the newsroom uh, all the time. The uh, you know the photographers, the business section, and the sports section. There's not always a, you know a uh, uh, a consensus there about how they're approaching stories and stuff like that, that you know, each department kind of uh, does their own things. And the, the editorial board is obviously something that's different. Uh, I think there's still in America uh, uh, not a clear understanding from people that an editorial board is really just uh, uh, editorial and it's, it's not, uh, uh, not to be viewed as, as, as factual. Um, so in a lot of cases, uh, editorial boards become uh, they, they could be very conservative, they could be very liberal, uh, they could be very non-involved. Uh, there, uh, For uh, all the newspapers that there are in America, uh, there are that many different types of uh, personalities on uh, uh, how editorial boards operate. What has worked for me and what uh, what I believe has worked for other people that uh, that I respect uh, over the years is that, that you just have to keep working on it, um, particularly if it's one, uh, an editorial board that is just not on your political party's side, what eventually happens is that you, if you keep giving, giving them good information and you keep working with them uh, on a, uh, a transparent basis, that if, if you get nothing else, by the end of the day, you're going to get you're going to get some respect, uh, and and that will go a long way, and that will eventually uh, come out in, in some editorials. Um, again, that that's been my experience over the years is that if if you keep working with them, be transparent and. Uh, 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 and honest uh, that uh, that eventually it's going to work in your favor, but it is going to take time. Uh, next question is, uh, how do you recommend Facebook as a legislative communication uh, tool? Uh, why or why not? Uh, we've had uh, a couple of really excellent uh, NCSL University webinar uh, series about social media uh, this year, and the my advice is that legislatures have to have a Facebook presence because uh, there's that segment of society in America that that's where they're going to for their information. Uh, I know I've got a 19-year-old and a 17-year-old uh, kid, and they've uh, grown up their entire life uh, watching me read newspapers, uh, but when it comes to them actually picking up a newspaper to read, they, they don't do it. They are communicating with their friends, uh, via text, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, 
uh, whatever the case may be. And so that segment of, of the population, that is where they're going. And I think that uh, uh, anyone that wants to have that kind of open communication with their constituents really needs that social uh, media component uh, to, uh, to go after. Um, I'm going to keep taking questions here as, as long as I've got them and people uh, stay on. It looks like we have about four or five more uh, in the queue here. Uh, the next one is, what should you look for in a public information officer? It's an excellent question. Uh, obviously, it has to be someone that, that uh, is a communicator. Uh, I started my career as a, as a journalist, and I just really feel that that was incredibly valuable to me uh, because I understood where reporters were coming from, and I was able to express that, that viewpoint to the uh, legislators that, uh, that I was working for. But I've also known a number of uh, former reporters that have gone into the uh, PR side of things, and, and they're not very good because they can't let, uh, let that the journalism part of them go, where they, uh, that everything has to be uh, 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 fully disclosed. Um, you have to be able to have some discretion uh, when you're a public information officer. Uh, you never want to lie to the press. You never want to mislead them or anything like that. But you're always going to come into situations where you have uh, information that is sensitive and is uh, uh, not uh, uh, not something that that, that, that should be uh, openly revealed. So you, you have to be able to have that uh, that kind of sensitivity to to those type of things. Um, the, the best public information officers that that I've known. Uh, they, they believe in the legislature, they believe in the process, they believe in the system, and, and they understand how, how reporters operate. And I think those are, are really keys to uh, what makes a successful, uh, successful one there. Um, with the uh, next question, with so much focus on the eight second soundbite and Capitol reporters being laid off in unprecedented numbers, it seems more press attention is being placed on press releases now than just a year ago. Uh, am I wrong? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, one trend that we definitely have noticed is that, you know, particularly in the smaller town newspapers and stuff, uh, the staff has been reduced uh, to such a point where I, I think we, we've we noticed that there are more press releases that are being printed uh, verbatim, uh, probably in larger size newspapers than uh, than we have seen over the last uh, 10, 15 years. So so in that regard, press, press releases do become very important because that's, uh, you're getting information directly to the citizens. The, the point I was making earlier about press releases and press conferences is that uh, when it comes to the Capitol Press Corps, that's not necessarily where you're always going to get your best, uh, um, that's not always going to generate uh, story ideas as much as you would think. But if you get that press release out and it gets to your local paper or uh, discussed on the, the local news, then definitely that makes press releases worthwhile. And I hope I have not come across the uh, giving you the impression that uh, uh, we don't want to continue doing press releases because they serve a valuable function. Again, social media and other other areas where uh, press releases are, are very important. Um, uh, next question is a freshman legislator. I am surprised how easily comments are misconstrued. Uh, and that's, again, another very uh, excellent observation. Um, I think all of us that, are, uh, that have been in this business uh, uh, can can easily recount a number of times where uh, something that we have said has not been uh, accurately uh, attributed. I remember clearly when I first started NCSL one time, my name appeared in an article in a paper that I, I didn't even talk to the reporter about. Uh, <laughs> so the reporter didn't call me, but somehow uh, my name got uh, switched up in, in some uh, press release they had or something, and you know those, those type of things happen. So there's 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 always human area, human error. But I, I think this comes back to uh, the first part of the presentation, understanding the cactus and understanding how they operate, and that reporters are human, they are going to make mistakes, and that when you leave an interview, uh, going back to those uh, headlining uh, phrases that uh, that I left you with. If you say, you know, we've, you know, we've talked about a lot of things, or you know, I just want to make sure that I'm very clear about what uh, what I said and what it meant. Uh, if you do that, that's going that's going to help. Uh, a lot of reporters, particularly capital reporters, I mean, they're they're there. They're not necessarily specialists on on particular issues. They're they're not, you know, one day, you know, one minute they're writing about education, the next thing they're writing about healthcare, the next time they're uh, looking at uh, energy issues. So, you know, they're, they're having to become experts on, on things. And again, veteran reporters, uh, and there are so much, so few of them uh, these days, uh, that uh, the, the, the newer reporters don't have that background. So I think it's always good, and my advice would be that, that uh, when you're at, done with an interview, just kind of wrap things up and make sure the reporter understood what, uh, 
uh, what you were saying. But uh, again, uh, to the legislator, it's uh, it's something that that happens all the time, and it's the right, it is not a good business to be in if uh, uh, if those things are uh, are troubling uh, to you because it, it, it's it's going to happen. I think that's been my advice to. Uh, any new member that uh, uh, I met with in, in Missouri, as I told them today, they, they are going to be misquoted and things are, they're, they're going to have a bad experience along the way and they they got to learn not to let that uh, um, disrupt their uh, uh, communication with the press. Um, next question, how do you politely decline an interview because they're a small media outlet? Um, this is another good question because uh, uh, sometimes the legislature just does, does not have the time uh, to meet with everyone that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that they need to. Um, one of the things I like to do in Missouri is that I would you know set up times where the speaker would meet with a, a handful of reporters uh, so they felt like they had access. Uh, so perhaps that's someone that you keep on a list and say you know uh, the uh, say the speaker is not going to have time to call you back today, but um, uh, how about if I set something up down the road where uh, we have a, a, a small meeting of reporters, and you can uh, sit in and, and then talk with the speaker or something that you know he just doesn't have time. And, and reporters are generally going to understand that, particularly if they're at, at smaller outlets, they uh, they will un understand. Uh, but it's uh, always good to know exactly what it is that they're wanting to uh, report on. Um, and uh, the last question is, what do you think uh, is the value of lo local talk radio, if any? Uh, the statistics I put up on the um, uh, screen earlier shows that you know uh, radio definitely uh, has an appeal to uh, people. I think 35 to 49 uh, years old, year olds, which are you know definitely a, a very important uh, voter demographic uh, and a very important uh, community uh, graphic uh, demographic because those people tend to be very uh, very involved with uh, with the committee. So. Um, you know, it's just like Fox News or MSNBC News. You know, they they are catering to certain uh, elements. Typically, your local talk show, uh, your talk radio uh, program, uh, they're going to have a certain segment that uh, uh, that, that appeals to too. So I think the the determination about whether you answer a request to talk to a local local talk uh, radio is 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 what you know what is the benefit that you're going to get uh, for that uh, particular time. I mean, a lot of these stations they want you to you know be on the air for half an hour. Uh, open yourself up to public questions and things like that. So all that has to be taken in the public. Uh, I mean, taken into consideration. But my experience is that you know the, the legislators uh, uh, in America today are, are are very very smart and and, and very capable. And if they uh, take the time to understand uh, how the media operates, uh, then they'll be able to handle those type of uh, even uh, difficult uh, questions. So I want to thank all of you for for hanging on today and uh, for. Uh, uh, for me dropping that poll question earlier, but uh, uh, this has uh, been a, a great discussion, and uh, maybe we'll continue this uh, at some other point. Uh, again, feel free to contact me by uh, email or phone anytime you'd like. So we thank you for joining us today, and remember you can keep track of uh, all NCSL webinars by going to www.ncsl.org.ncslu. Our next webinar in the NCSL University series will be held July 17th, when we hold a session on federalism and the important policy decisions state legislators from across the nation will be making at NCSL's annual legislative summit in Chicago, August 6th through the 9th. We hope you've enjoyed this discussion and look forward to being with you at our next webinar or NCSL meeting. On behalf of the Legislative Staff Coordinating Committee and NCSL, this is Gene Rose.